thank you, and uh, uh, and al it's almost good night. Not quite. Um, I was speaking to my wife on the mobile before I came in. You've got to bear in mind I support Spurs, and that I went to Cambridge. And she said, "What's it like to do this?" I said, "It's a bit like playing for Arsenal. <laughs> you know, it's a kind of recognition, but uh, it's definitely uh, playing for the wrong team." But I'm definitely not in the wrong team in relation to this, to this motion. And it's very interesting to hear the language of the 70s. Just to say about the 1970s, which was my childhood, I was there. Um, it, can you imagine a time when state schools had playing fields? I know it's a very dramatic thought, but there, there were, it, it was not at all the way that it's depicted. Um, it, it was a time of, of enormous change where there was an enormous profis, uh, promise of a different way. That way didn't come. And, what I'm, and when I was listening to you describing the 70s, I just picked up a few phrases. Declining economy, desperate need for change, blackouts, declining public services, trains in a privatised service that can't work between London and Oxford. Um, We've got, to, we've got to understand that what Margaret Thatcher did was not change the dynamics of decline, she merely took sides. And she took sides with the rich against the poor, she took sides with those who had power against those who did not. And this is the tragedy of Margaret Thatcher, is that we are still living with decline. We are still living in an economy that cannot generate value. So there's nothing in what I'm saying here to argue that Margaret Thatcher was not a great politician. She was a magnificent politician. She dominated her time and she did change the political consensus. All this is compatible with what I'm going to argue is that far from saving Britain, she was not the only but one of the chief sources of our present malaise, our inability to generate value, to uphold civic virtue, I know that, so that institutions are easy to take a handbag to, but there was a degradation of our great <coughs> civic institutions, the BBC and not least this university. So my argument is that Margaret Thatcher in fact laid the foundations for, for an intensification of decline, and I want to go through that. She gave incentives to vice and did not really support the great English traditions of liberty and democracy. And the reason for this, and I wish it to be understood clearly, because it's, um, you know, narrative, storytelling frames politics. All of you who are studying PPE here, you will never be told this. You're going to be told that data frames it, that empirical information. Believe me, I've spent time with PPE graduates to know. But the story you tell and the story of the winter of discontent framed politics for 30 years, and it's time to debunk it. Her rule led not to the liberation of the poor, not to the releasing of the entrepreneurial spirit. Her rule led to the domination of finance and the subordination of the substantive economy. It led to the great growth of the city of London, which subordinated Westminster and the rest of the country. And although you know, I have very mixed feelings, which I would say if he were here about Ken Livingstone, the abolition of the GLC, the abolition of citywide democracy in London, and the growth of the City of London as a financial centre is an enormous, is, is much more than a symbolic representation of this. Because what it marked, and Rupert, you must learn the difference between deficit and debt. Under Margaret Thatcher, personal <coughs> debt grew. The deficit declined. And what Margaret Thatcher's rule represented was the emergence of debt and finance as the main motors of growth and the humiliation of work and of workers as a source of value. As Connor said, entrepreneurs generate value, risk generates value, technology generates value. She even got to the stage, I think, where even universities might generate value. Anything generated value except work and workers. But work is an enormous, labour value is an enormous source um, of value, and it was discarded. So what we had in the end was the domination of the rich, and the demoralisation of our great institutions. Ultimately, I think we might say that she laid the foundation for the disintegration of Britain through her contempt for the varied traditions of solidarity that exist in different regions in our country in favour of two things, and it hasn't been brought out clearly enough. On the one hand, it is absolutely the case that she was an advocate of the free market, 
but also the strengthening of state, of collectivist state powers. Connor said it so eloquently, you go up as an individual and you plant the flag for the nation, but in the middle of that somewhere is something called society. And that was never part of her scheme. So it's very important to see, and it's very important to relate this to what Sue argued, is, is that the, when we argue that the crisis of 2008, that the crash of 2008 has its roots in Thatcherism, it's to do with the emergence of an economy whose pathway was dominated by finance and financial services, which led to an erosion of the de development of value. And that is a very serious argument. So at the root of the problem with Margaret Thatcher is her conception of modernity. It was a life lived without tradition, without supporting institutions. It was a very isolated and lonely life in which there were only two real poles, the individual and the collective. And her greatest claim to modernization, which we've returned to throughout the evening, was taking on the unions and cutting them down to size. This allowed, it's argued, for the modern... My God, I've only done page one. <laughs> OK, moving swiftly on. <laughs> um, the, the argument was that by, by taking on the unions and, and, and undermining workers, that this led to greater efficiency. But what it led, as I say, was just to the taking of sides. The problem with Britain was the union movement and the management. It was labour and capital. And far from laying any challenge to a common good, to a partnership, she sided with capital in the subordination of the unions. So, that's the fundamental argument. And to counter the argument put forward that there was no choice, I just asked you to look at the German economy. Now, I had, the most fun I had writing this paper was looking up the quotes of Margaret Thatcher about West Germany and Germany. And you could say that it was a kind of Britain in disguise. It had over-regulated labour markets, unreformed local banks, workers on boards, the undermining of efficiency. There was established uh, labour value and labour protection and therefore it could not be a competitive economy. But Germany understood that there had to be a common good, a constructive alternative, in order to compete more effectively where all shared in beneficial constraints. So the result of the comparative experiment, Thatcher, Thatcherism versus the social market, the free market versus the social market, partnership, constraints on capital, worker representation versus financial, growth is in, and it has to be said that Germany came out of 2008 in much better shape than us. We had debt, deficit, and the single biggest, you know, you talk about the sig biggest single transfer of assets since the Reformation with the housing, but the single biggest transfer of wealth from the public to the private sector was in 2008 with the bank bailout, and that was the biggest since the Norman Conquest. So I think that the bailout was the ultimate end of Thatcher's reliance on the City of London and the financial sector as the motor for growth, and that there needs to be a turn to a genuine recognition of labour value. So what I say to you to conclude, because I know that the, that the bell, for whom the bell tolls, and it always seems to toll for me. Um, <laughs> so do not be taken in by the ideological narrative of the Tea Party, which I think was manifest most beautifully by Rupert. And in that narrative, the 1970s, there were no sherbet lemons, there were no playing fields, there were no families, there was no mo social mobility. There was essentially a liberation from the Soviet Union supported by militant unions. And I, I just tell you that only in the pages of the Daily Mail and perhaps ITV News w w was that the case. The reality is that there wasn't any constructive constraint put on the power of the rich, the power of capital, the power of finance. There was an abandonment of whole regions of the country. In 1979, Jim Callaghan went to the country with a manifesto built around a partnership model with the unions. No one mentioned here how the Labour government took on the unions and challenged militancy in the union movement. He went for a partnership model, a devolution of power to the regions, a strengthening of vocational education, greater accountability in Parliament. Remember when he, when he said... Hmm? Uh, that was after Tony Blair said that we are going to have rights now, so we have to just inspire that. No, no, if you look, I, I, in order to prepare for this, I read through the 1979 manifesto, Labour manifesto, to say that I was shocked would be an understatement. It, they were arguing for greater accountability for Parliament, 
Remember Margaret Thatcher's joke about Jim Callaghan when uh, his son-in-law likened him to Moses. You know, originally she said, they said, keep, her speechwriter said, keep taking the tablets. And, um, and she put it out as keep taking the pills. Anyway, the point being there was an alternative and a constructive alternative to Thatcher that could have reconciled capital and labour, could have had a genuinely common good. It wasn't taken and the result is an economy based on finance and debt, a degradation of work, a lack of an industrial economy, and I think that we could have really done a lot better than that. Thank you.